Wasabi Wallet. Unfairly Private. What is going on? Welcome, everybody. It's a great Friday. Uh, welcome to another episode of Why Are We Bullish? We got a killer panel today. Super stoked. And what a day for it. Holy shit. The price. It's just going crazy. There's laser eyes everywhere. It's fucking insane. <laughs> so we'll get into a lot of that. It's going to be a lot of fun. As always, this is live. So anything can happen. Uh, you know, there may be technical difficulties. So just a, a, a quick message from my friend Bill here. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live. And thing sucks. I will never not play that during a live stream. Uh, and it, there's already over 100 people in here watching. So awesome. Smash that like button. Give this a share. Let's get this show rolling. As always, I am Ben with the BTC Sessions, and this is your daily session. <laughs> All right, before we bring on the panel, let's take a look at where we are in the market. It's been a wild day. Uh, we're up over 55,000 now, 55,466. It did get up over 56 for a little while there. Uh, and just a side note, 69,000 in Canada. Nice. <laughs> now, a couple other little metrics here. Uh, for a single US dollar, you will grab yourself 1,803 Satoshis. That's dropping. You cannot get as many sats for your dollar. 88.73% uh, of all Bitcoin that will ever be mined have already been mined. And as far as fees go, if you're looking to get into the next block, around 128 sats per byte will do you. If you're willing to wait an hour, you can cut that down to 80 sats per byte. But, you know, high fees. Might look at a Lightning Network if you're doing a lot of regular transactions. I've done videos on that if you're so inclined. Um, over 70K, over 70K in, in Canada here. Nice. All right. Uh, and before we get started, of course, shout out to sponsors of the show, Leden.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin for a variety of different services. I've used them a few times to save my ass when I needed to get my hands on dollars, but I didn't want to sell my Bitcoin because that's a taxable event. And I was worried about ha having to buy back in at a higher price. So I was able to deposit Bitcoin, get dollars to my bank within 24 hours. And when I paid back those dollars, I get back the same amount of Bitcoin, which is nice. Um, they also have their savings accounts for Bitcoin and USDC, interest rates of up to 12.25% annually paid monthly, and got to breathe. They do have their B2X offering. It uses the same loan mechanism to instantly buy you more Bitcoin, effectively doubling your Bitcoin on the spot. You can check them out. Links in the show notes down below. If you opt to get one of those uh, loan products using that link, they'll give you 25 bucks for free into your savings account. Up next, we got the Kobo Vault, one of my regularly used hardware wallets. I love this thing. It's fully air gapped, which means you never plug it into an internet connected device. It's all done offline via QR code. And that keeps the keys to your money safe and offline. I tend to use it with Blue Wallet on my mobile and with Wasabi Wallet on my desktop, but there's a ton of other options. And it's great for multi-sig so check it out links below um of course i'm living on bitcoin one way that helps me do that is bit refill they have every damn uh, gift card you could ever imagine super easy to use you can pay with bitcoin on chain or lightning network for cheap and fast transactions and bonus you earn sats back as you shop so if you're looking to treat yourself with the explosion in price this could be a good way to do it and finally don't back up your wallets on simply pieces of paper because if there's a fire, there's a flood. If you accidentally throw it out because it's a scrap of paper, you could be screwing yourself. So get it in solid steel, something like the Bill Foddle over on privacypros.io. Links for that below as well. Guys, let's dive into the show. Let me get rid of my screen and bring in my guests here. Very excited to have everybody here. I'm going to go down the line and let you guys introduce yourselves. It's going to be a killer day. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it to Alexandra first. Uh, let everybody know who you are, where you're from, what you do. All right. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of an echo. I don't know if we can hear that. Oh, that might be Mags. Maybe Mags, when you're not talking, just uh, mute just in case. All right, yeah. cool. Um, so I'm Alexandra, uh, last name, or 
<laughs> Alexandra 933 on Twitter. And I run the Advanced Tech Podcast. Uh, it's all about emerging tech and talking to people creating the tech of tomorrow, um, people that are kind of grounded in today and, and solving problems. So it's been really focused on Bitcoin. Uh, we also delve into artificial intelligence, VR, all that other kind of stuff. Um, I write frequently. I just had an article published in Citadel 21. It's called Outpost 77. It's a very far future um, sci-fi piece that um, brings kind of Bitcoin to the just to the norm. It's all about Bitcoin kind of existing. So that's I, I don't know if I've read that one. When, what issue was that? So first one this year, volume nine. Oh shit! I gotta read that. I got I'm gonna do that as soon as we finish this show. I was unprepared. I did not know that was a thing. So, apologies. Uh, let's yeah. go down the line. Megs, can you let everybody know who you are, what you do? Hey guys, I'm crypto underscore Megs on Twitter. Um, I've been in the space for probably three years. Um, you may know me from such hits as Quadriga. I represent all affected users uh, of that massive fraud and failure. Um, I helped launch 3AQ's Bitcoin fund uh, in terms of helping out with the initial public offering last year. Um, and um, I'm, I'm getting more and more into mining just because of my background. I spent uh, about a decade in um, working with heavy industry, trying to decarbonize um, uh, various types of industries, working around electricity markets and carbon pricing. And I think it's a perfect intersection um, with Bitcoin. So I think those are the highlights there. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to have you. Let's oh, keep going down sold. the line. I, I have to say that. Yes. Oh, and, and, and <laughs> Jack, meta mesh. <laughs> Jack of all trades, everything. <laughs> Let's dive over to, uh, I, I hope I pronounce it correctly because I haven't actually spoken to you other than Twitter, but uh, Rohan. Time. Yeah, Rohan, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Take awesome. it away. Who are you? What do you do? I, I, and maybe let everybody know how I came across you because it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hi guys, my name is Rohan. Um, I'm the creator of Bitcoin or shit.com. Um, I'm not sure if anyone, if everyone here hasn't seen it yet, it's basically a website that compares stupid shit that you bought over the last decade to if you bought Bitcoin instead. And uh, some stuff is pretty crazy. I think a uh, shake weight, if you bought it when it released, would have been nine or I think now at 55K, I think it's like $12 billion uh, <laughs> today. And there's some other less crazy examples. But yeah, I pretty much made that site with my um, with my best friend and roommate, Angel Herrera. We basically were, you know, he's the guy that orange pilled me and I was a big skeptic before. And at, at first, you know, one of the first things we did when I was first learning about it was we just looked up you know, price FOMO calculators and stuff like that. And it was pretty crazy to just think of how little money could compound over time because of how important this is to the planet and everybody. And so, yeah, we just looked at that and we just thought the perfect comparison would just be the dumb shit that's lying around in our apartment and other stuff that we bought. So, yeah. And in my day I job, love. I work in growth at like a startup called Main Street. But yeah, mostly crypto. <laughs> that's that's great awesome uh and we will pull up that website before we get into our reasons for being bullish because i want to play a quick game of seeing who bought what dumb shit but let's go. <laughs> i i digress <laughs> let's uh let's go last down the line will can you please introduce yourself let people know what you do absolutely oh, hey world how about now good good oh. Um, I'm Will, so I run Foldapp. Uh, we have this insane job where we just give Bitcoin away. It doesn't make any sense, but we give a lot of it away to people every single day. Um, and we released the Fold card, which has kind of been an early access closed beta with a couple thousand people. And we are on the cusp of launching it to the rest of the United States and maybe to Canada in the short future. So don't excited tease to be here. <laughs> Don't tease me, man. I've been in your DMs. <laughs> Come on. I need it. I, 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 you, you and Mags alone uh, account for quite a bit of the, the, uh, the, the reason why Canada is going to be prioritized. I'll say that. Nice. He doesn't even want to read my DMs. He's like. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Canada? We're the reason. It's coming. I it's hope coming, I'm on the top of the list then. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, let's let's get rolling here. First thing we're gonna do though is we gotta we gotta play a round of did you buy this fucking stupid shit? <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a few clicks here, and if you bought it, you raise your hand in shame. Uh, okay. So uh, 
you know, again, huge shout out to Rohan for putting this together. Uh, it's it's hilarious. Uh, so on the website here, it says if you bought Bitcoin instead of fucking stupid shit, you'd have and then a bunch of dollar signs. Click here. This can't be that bad. Let's see what we get. If you bought Bitcoin instead of fucking Tony Robbins seminar, <laughs> you'd have $174,312 or 3.15 Bitcoin original price, 2,950 bucks for one of those seminars in uh, March of 2017. So has anybody been to a Tony Robbins seminar? I don't know, but isn't believing in yourself priceless? <laughs> That's yeah, true. I was, I was going to say, honestly, this one shouldn't be on here. This is definitely 100% worth it. Who needs one hundred seventy-four thousand dollars? I do love, I do love me some Tony Robbins. Uh, I do have a few of his books, so I'm curious how much that translates to. But is, hey, is Tony Robbins a Bitcoiner? I, I don't think he is. Does he have like I just lost all respect? Oh no, yeah, we can work. We can work on that. We can work on that. Tony, right. I know you're watching. <laughs> yeah, come on, Tony. Let's do it. Uh, let's do a couple more here. If you bought Bitcoin instead of a fucking Toy Story 3 DVD, you'd have $12,176,000. million. Bitcoin. Who got that? I'm pretty sure I must have I had. It. Yeah, this is, I don't this know. This was a We're direct experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I rented oh, it, so it's only about half of that loss. I went for the red. Eleven dollars. That's smart. Look wow. at that. Nice. <laughs> All right, let's hit the next button or the fuck Robin Hood button. Uh, <laughs> if you bought Bitcoin instead of a fucking DJI Phantom drone, you'd have four point seven mil or eighty five Bitcoin, twelve hundred bucks at the time when you bought it, which was in two thousand thirteen. Did anybody get a DJI DJI drone? Oh no. Well. Well, and not only that, and not only that, but not with Bitcoin day of using still. <laughs> still, opportunity cost could have gone to Bitcoin. Um, and this particular drone I bought lasted two days because I flew it into the freeway, so uh, oh, it didn't shit. even last long. Horrible. <laughs> I watched my no neighbor, one, no, no one was harmed in that. I watched my neighbor, same thing, DJI drone. Uh, we learned something very important about waterfalls and airflow because it sucked it in. And then we spent an hour scouring and we only found one little piece along uh, the river. Oh, wow. God. Okay, let's let's do one more. I should have listened to my friend. We'll hit that button. If you bought Bitcoin instead of a fucking Wii U, you'd have 1.5 mil, 27 Bitcoin. It originally cost 299 bucks in 2012. Who had a Wii U? I will admit that I do have a switch right now because me and my wife love us some uh, some Mario Kart. So I'm sure I'll be oh, looking back. Yeah. yeah, is but is that going to be that's going to be added to the site in a few years? I'm sure. Uh, oh, but yeah. we were we were reminiscing, uh, and actually, I'm going to put part of the blame on Will here because I was using Fold App when it was spend your bitcoin on coffee in 2014 or 15 no. and uh we were oh, we were, no. we, were we were talking about it and i was like hey remember when we went to starbucks and we both got like a, a latte and like actual food so it was like a 30 dollar like starbucks trip and i was like yeah that's over ten thousand dollars now that we spent on a single trip to Starbucks, thanks to my good buddy over at, at Fold, hey, Will. Hey, Ben, Ben, we did give you 20% off, though, so enjoy that. That's, that's <laughs> true. Only $8,000, but I do appreciate it. Yeah, uh, this is a depressing website, but, man, it puts you in check. <laughs> it's fantastic. So uh, we're going to dive in. Again, the, the general rule of the show is the three R's. So the three R's are... Each one of us is going to give a reason. Then we're going to riff on that reason. And then we're going to rotate to the next person. So I'm going to start with my reason for being bullish this week. And uh, it happened today. Uh, we just surpassed a $1 trillion market cap for Bitcoin. That is insane <laughs> that you cannot ignore that. Um this is a, a huge milestone. I mean, like it was big when it was a billion. It was big when it was a hundred billion last bull market. That was a huge thing to see. A trillion dollars, though. That's that's crazy. Um, I feel like it's impossible, as if it wasn't already impossible to ignore by you know every boardroom across America, let alone the entire world. Uh, even more so 
especially today. You can't see Bitcoin trillion with a T and ignore it anymore. And the naysayers continue to be mistaken. So I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go down the line and get any everybody's thoughts on this. Uh, let's go to Alexandra first. What are you feeling about the one T today? Sure. So I'm all about the laser ray until 100K laser eyes because that seemed to do something to price. <laughs> <laughs> it could be we're, we were so laser laser focused on uh, one trillion, but uh, yeah, it, it could be like, uh, w what do you think this does to naysayers up to this point? Do you think they start to look and go, wow? I hope so. I mean, one of the most powerful things we have in this space are memes. And uh, there's another thing that happened this week that's pretty cool. Um, so Jack, uh, Jack Mahler's from Stripe just hired three chief meme officers. And I believe they're mostly behind the the laser eyes, so that's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> I do love it. I do love it. Uh, how about you, Mags? What are you thinking about the the fact that we pass one trillion today? I'm super excited. Um, I, I listen to a lot of macro kind of economic uh, discussions, and for for a while now, we've been hearing that the one trillion number really opens up this asset class to a whole slew of different types of investors that have restrictions. So once we've passed that threshold, you know, it, it's only good for NGU tech, right? <laughs> number go up. Um, so I'm super excited about it. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I can't wait for the day where we're no longer seen as this emerging asset class, like we're an established asset class. And I think that one trillion helps us get there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, definitely well on its way. Uh, Rohan, what are you what are you feeling about the one T? Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of Kathy Wood, and I think one of the most simple sentences that she said that changed my perspective on all of this was like most people don't understand exponential growth, and so to me, the one trillion is going to be, I think, a very very small milestone in the grand scheme of things, and it's not even that crazy of a deal right now because we're starting to get used to what a true exponential graph looks like. And so I'm very excited to hit that milestone, but I'm also just as excited that this is not where everyone's saying, oh, we hit a mil, we hit a trillion, we're done. It's like, it's almost like, okay, on to the next one. And I think that's such a, a great perspective to see today when we did hit this milestone. Yeah. Who needs the moon when you've got Mars, right? So yeah. How about you, Will? How are you feeling? <laughs> I mean, we are now at 1 trillion. Gold's market cap is 10 trillion. It seems like it's this is an any day now type of thing where Bitcoin starts to eat these asset classes. And to Mag's point, there's like we always talk about unit bias from a retail perspective that oh one Bitcoin seems too expensive for the average person. But suddenly now when one Bitcoin is you know worth you know 50, 50 K or whatever, now it seems like an asset that is for major new sources of money to come in. Now it starts to enter an entirely new phase where we are expanding the different groups of people that are coming in here and that are looking at Bitcoin as an asset class. And we are going to look at this little bump and it's going to look like a smooth exponential curve in a, in a couple months to a year. And uh, it's all going to be on the way to hitting gold, surpassing gold. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see I don't see the upper limit here. I don't see the bound and I don't think we have any reason to expect there is one. Well, I mean, really, there is no top when you can print as many dollars as you want, especially when you're measuring in dollars, right? Like there, there is no top to that when the measuring stick is infinite. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's in hindsight, it was in, in, inevitable, right? Like, so it's just, yeah. Anyways, uh, I'm very excited about this. Again, uh, there's well over 100 people in here. Smash that like button. Give this a share. Uh, I have the chat up, so I'm pulling in uh, whatever I see that tickles my fancy. Uh, so thank you guys for all being here. We're going to jump down the line to our next reason for being bullish. And I think, Alexandra, I, I don't know if you wanted to uh, if your specific reason was about the laser eyes or if you had another reason, but if laser eyes was your answer, then you can elaborate on it. Otherwise, uh, dive into your reason. Yeah, um, actually, it was. <laughs> OK, <laughs> good. Um, All right. yeah. So some people watching will not have any idea what the fuck we're talking about for laser eyes, but <laughs> we can dive into what's happening, why we're putting laser eyes on our profile pictures and maybe even a little bit of Bitcoin meme culture and its implications. So you can you can take it away however you see fit. 
Yeah. Um, again, I think that, you know, meme culture is like we've kind of memed a lot of this into existence, which is pretty awesome. And when I say me I, or we like it's not me, it's the you know, it's all the people creating the memes like there's some amazing people out there. And again, I think that Jack really, uh, you know, hiring his, his chief meme officer triumvirate, I think, was a really smart decision. And I think more smart companies are going to start doing that, hopefully. I mean, there's such power in memes. It's they're sim they're simple, um, but they're complex at the same time. And they like just like right now, um, Nick Szabo and Elon Musk both have laser eyes. And that happened, I think, within 48 hours. Right. So that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of power to memes. Um, and the laser eye part, I mean, it's all about laser focus, right? Like laser focus until we're 100K and then, you know. <laughs> and then, and then our, we'll have to have some sort of new eyes. Somebody was, I think it was Jameson Lop <laughs> that said after 100K, our laser eyes turn into diamond hands. So <laughs> I do, I, I do like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, it's so funny because it happens so quickly all of a sudden, I mean, Bitcoin Twitter gets on something and then it just, it, within a day, it's like, you're shamed into not, whenever I started saying, replying to people on Twitter, I was like, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of you not having laser eyes. So <laughs> you know, like, it just, it kind of just swept through everywhere. And now kind of mainstream is starting to notice it and go, what the hell is this? Like, I do like, the headlines. <laughs> I, I can't wait for the headlines because there's going to be some of them. Obviously, somebody's picking up. I saw somebody retweet. And there, it was because Cynthia Loomis the uh, from Wyoming changed her profile picture, which is super hilarious. Uh, but somebody retweeted retweeted an image of it and they're like i don't understand it but until somebody tells me otherwise i'm gonna assume it's a QAnon thing so like <laughs> you gotta love like this is the jump of well i i didn't do any effort to understand the meme so i'm gonna assume it's nazis probably so <laughs> that's hilarious because a congress account monitors the pictures of like it's senators and it showed that she changed it from like laser eyes that were tiny to like even redder laser eyes. <laughs> I think it's just so amazing that we have, <laughs> you know, someone in government putting that as well as obviously Michael Saylor and Musk. It's just, it's, it's, it's a movement. <laughs> it's it's so funny. Ro Rowan didn't have any. I, I got to, dude, I, I was like, dude, you got to have now. some for the thumbnail. <laughs> no, I get the clout now of saying I had laser eyes before Elon Musk. I mean, I don't, I, I could die today. It would be fine. <laughs> I did want to say something on the meme thing, by the way, because it's something I think about a lot. And I think we were all faced with this and saw it with the GME thing. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of the best memes that really spread a lot actually come from like a really deep or well thought out, you know, thought process or idea or ideology. And what ends up happening is the internet superpower is taking a complex idea and disseminating it in simpler and simpler ways. And I think memes are like that final place of simplicity that it does convey 10,000 words when a regular picture might convey 1,000 and a word might con convey one. And so I think like the best memes that do find a lot of virality or people attached to really come from a well-researched or well-thought-out idea. And then people simplify it to make it just hit instantly and either make you laugh or make you join in on the movement or whatever it is. And I think that's, yeah, like now more people are catching on to it. That's the underrated superpower of the 2020 to the two th now. I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> What's your favorite meme so, meme so far, guys? I, I, I'm really fond of fix the money, fix the world myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Um, uh, you know what? I mean, the, a lot, the, you the go toxic ahead. Masculinity man. one was pretty, I mean, like it didn't start out as a meme, but it's just like, okay, really? Like <laughs> Bitcoin is now toxic masculinity. I thought that was, and then everyone yeah. was memeing that was, I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, a you, really, it, so, so, sorry. Just, um, I think like, we as Bitcoiners are such a strong community. Cyber hornets are such a formidable foe against FUD. And, and I feel like we've been banding together even stronger recently. And then like, we also celebrate our wins. And so this laser raid to 100K is us Bitcoiners coming together and celebrating, you know, that 100K that's in our laser site. And, and I love that, you know, we're here for, for the good and the bad for each other. Yeah, a couple good ones in the chat here. Uh, Angel Herrera says, fix the money, fix the world as well. And also uh, Towers Comics says, everything divided by 21 million. That one's great. I love that one. 
<laughs> Will, do you have any fave fave memes of the past little bit? I mean, I think the money printer go burr is one of the best uh, roundabout ways of talking about uh, what Bitcoin is without talking about Bitcoin. And I think the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit to it to my when I get to my bullish moment there. But I think it's always good when we I think that meme reaches people where they're at without even being part of the cyber hornets, without being um, maybe clued into it. I think it, it's it's a real problem that is affecting every single person. Um, and uh, it then they're asking questions about what is what is out there that can be a solution. And Bitcoin is uh, the Bitcoin community is really there waiting to to welcome you. And so I'd say the Burr meme is, is just phenomenal. I mean, have fun staying poor while harsh is, is extremely effective and good as well. Um, I, I, I I mean, weekly yeah. we get a absolute gold star meme coming up so i i think okay so let's let's get a a round table consent well we i'm we may not reach consensus on this but uh uh feelings on have fun staying poor so i'll i'll give my take so i find it hilarious but i also get why it pisses people off but the reason i find it hilarious is because Bitcoiners, especially OGs that have been around for years now, they've been dispelling the same shitty FUD for years, and they're just so exhausted. And what would have been just hours of refuting bullshit as a service to get people to understand what's going on, has they effectively, a ton of people on Twitter just threw up their hands and just were like, you know what? Just have fun staying poor. Like, so I get it. It's like a decade of just cynicism and anger over having to re-explain yourself summed up in a four letter acronym, which is super hilarious. So to me, like I get why some people would see that and be like, well, that's kind of harsh. But at the same time, I mean, you explain something for a decade, you're going to be a little bit, disillusioned and doing it again so i don't know what do you guys think have fun staying poor eh, eh, or eh. i'm with you i think <laughs> any of my friends or like family members if i said that to them they just wouldn't get it they freak out but in terms of fighting fudsters like udi puts it the right way and it's what you said basically it's like well have fun staying poor and it's like they're like how how do, you, how do they respond to that right they just like Oh, I guess it keeps going up and it I am poor. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody in the, I, I the think chat, it's the best. They, no, sorry, I was it. just gonna say somebody in the chat said it's important that it says staying poor and not being poor. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess yeah. I mean no. also it's it's who it's directed to, right? Because a lot of people will say that to like Peter Schiff, who's clearly fine, but it's like, well, I mean, you're being a, a an ass hat, so I'm gonna tell you to have fun staying poor. So 100%, yeah. or you're I don't know if I, 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 it's related to this idea of Bitcoin as a life raft, too, is and this idea of moving your unit of account to Bitcoin is that fundamentally when we're talking about resting our entire savings in fiat, you will have nothing no control over that being inflated away. That will happen. You are building your house on an unstable foundation, which will do as much as it can to have you have fun staying poor. You can give you a lot of you know things to do along the way down, but it's going on the way down. And so I think the have fun staying poor is a, 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 a blunt way of saying, I think you should really look about your foundations of what you believe is you're building your wealth on and think about other possibilities. And it is a little bit about Bitcoiners being a little salty after a long time, but um, I, I think they all have good intentions. Also, it's not exclusionary. Like all you need to do to stop having fun staying poor is to come over to Bitcoin. So it's like the, <laughs> the moment you do that, you're no longer having fun. You're now no longer staying poor. So it's it's a very, it's a quick fix is what I'm getting at. I think, Rowan, it's great I think for, you had something. Oh yeah, I just think it's a great conversion tool. I I, I don't think people are, are that sensitive, especially the people I've seen this like directed or replied to. And I think ultimately, like just you know, I've been in this situation where I mean, I'm, I have friends that are pretty progressive or tech forward or whatever it is. But like when you go up to somebody or you're talking to somebody about Bitcoin, it's very hard to wrap it up without sounding like you're trying to convince them. And if you get into that zone, I just find it like way less effective 
than basically saying like, yo, I'm, I'm on this ride, like I'm down and I think you should get on, but like it's up to you. And I feel that kind of um, tone, tonality is expressed perfectly with have fun staying poor. I totally get where people say it's aggressive, but I think it's, it's exactly what we're just talking about with the memes. There's a lot of depth to it, you know, about inflation, the dollar not being like valued as much. And that's where you're putting your savings and stuff like that. But it's just put into this concise thing that's easy to spread. And I would bet a lot that that has actually gotten people to look into Bitcoin. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go down the line. We're, we're close to 150 people watching live. Smash that like button. Give this a share. It really does help. It gets it in front of more <laughs> eyeballs. Uh, we're going to jump to our next reason. We're going over to Mags. Mags, uh, take it away. I know what you're going to talk about. I'm very excited. I also have questions for you regarding it. So go ahead. So why am I bullish? Well, first of all, Canada launched the first Bitcoin ETF yesterday. And and honestly, just looking at the numbers yesterday, it was incredible. You know, it traded over, you know, 200 million in shares on its first day. And just to put it into context, this is 10 times the average of any ETF. It's It would rank in like all time top five ETF debuts. Um, and, 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 but, but, but we got the numbers. Uh, I just got the numbers today um, from um, Eric, Eric Ball, who he's, a, he's from Bloomberg. And it's actually traded today at 350 million. So it's a 40% jump from yesterday and three times more than any ETF like this, like, it's happening. Like we got our ETF. The numbers are amazing. It's so good to see it happening in Canada, especially after Quadriga. Like we needed a win. And and I think it's such a good product um, because as we've seen before for these closed end funds like Grayscale or, uh, you know, 3AQ's QBTC, there was the Galaxy um, uh, CI Investments. There were a few closed end funds. And what would happen is there was this massive demand from people or institutions um, you know, to 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 buy these limited shares. And because, again, limited and scarcity, um, it was causing these big premiums. So retail investors would come in and they'd be buying, you know, Bitcoin, putting in their tax advantaged accounts, but it'd be at like 20 percent. Well, this ETF is buying at net asset value NAV. So you're not like losing, you know, this 20 percent. And, and I think it's amazing that we have this product available and not just for retail, but an ETF structure allows more types of institutions to purchase and hold Bitcoin because um, some of them have specific restrictions around what they can own and an ETF kind of fits there. So I think I'm super bullish that we have an ETF. I think it bodes well for getting one in the US because this sets precedent. Like we have one, you know, just north of the border and it's really cool that it happened in Canada. So that's why I'm bullish. <laughs> so I, I was wondering if you could explain something um, and I kind of saw this noted on Twitter, but so there's 3IQ and Galaxy Digital and they have their their closed end funds and GBTC is the same kind of deal, um, whereas an ETF is structured differently um, in that it more accurately kind of tracks the price of Bitcoin. And I was wondering if you knew uh, the reason as to why in terms of why it's structured and how like, you know, one is able to accrue more Bitcoin as people come in, as opposed to buying a set fixed amount. So maybe you could touch on that. Yeah, so so I touched on it briefly. So how a closed end fund works is typically at an initial public offering IPO, they collect a certain amount of money. So let's say a hundred million um, from uh, you know people that want to invest. And then that goes out and buys about a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin minus, you know, different brokerage fees, listing fees, etc. And these closed end funds, that's what's trade. These shares, it gets split across a certain number of shares. Each shares has a certain amount of Bitcoin. And that's what's traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange or in the US for a grayscale. And now what ends up happening, though, is um, you know, there's some people that they're like, I, I can't even begin to figure out how to hold Bitcoin. I don't want to deal with custody or people in Canada, for example, put it can put it in their retirement or tax free savings accounts, which means that, um, you know, in the future, I will never have to pay tax on any gains. So, of course, I would want to put it into this tax advantage account in the U.S. There's I believe they're called IRAs. Um, and so, um, you know, there's there's uh, there's this 
demand because that's for some that's the only way they can hold it in these kind of tax advantage accounts or or like it's simpler so that demand shows up as a premium to how much the assets are actually worth the bitcoin's worth so historically we've had as high as about 45 percent premium because there was such a demand for these limited shares um in december november is about 20 percent today it's actually treating at a discount as in People, I think people are kind of bailing on these funds because they're closed end. Plus, the fees um, are, are, you know, anywhere from uh, 1.95 to I think 1.75 for these closed end funds. Whereas the ETF has a fee of 1%, like a management fee of all nav. And so people are like, well, an extra 1% per year is getting eaten away. Of course, I want to keep that 1%, right? And the last thing is, so, so you know. These closed end funds, they trade, you know, these limited shares and every now and then maybe they inject more capital. Um, they kind of do reopenings, but the ETF is continuously buying. So it's it's, it's buying Bitcoin, it's, it's issuing or redeeming shares. And so because it's not this like scarce thing, there isn't that premium or discount. But the market is kind of getting out of whack because if like there's less demand. Um, for these funds, and I'm looking at them right now, you know, QBTC is 11% uh, percent discount, uh, BTCG is, again, 11 you know, GBTC, actually, GBTC is a premium, which is kind of interesting. But anyways, the point is, these are trading at a discount. So if you own it, you're kind of like, crap, <laughs> I'm not doing so great. But it gets really interesting, actually, from an arbitrage perspective. Because if you're about to buy, you're like, hey, I could buy Bitcoin at a discount <laughs> to the net asset value, right? So it depends on where you are. If you already own it, you're like, not very happy. <laughs> but if you're about to buy or, or, or you have an opportunity to arbitrage, that 11% starts to look really interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how, what, what kind of you know, response there is. Maybe they're going to try to roll some of these funds into an ETF. Um, I, I don't know the proper procedures and how long that takes or if that's even under consideration right now. But I think, you know, a, a lot of people I'm getting a lot of concerns. So so I hope to see. Yeah, I don't like to see my stuff shading as uh, trading at a discount. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's everybody think about uh, the now that this is launched, the prospect of uh, uh, an ETF in the U.S. in in the mid to near term? What's everybody feel free to jump in if you got a well, thought. We have one, right? Tesla. No, I'm just kidding. I just heard today that it's a billion at zero percent <laughs> interest like yeah. what way to go my yeah I want, I want that rate i want i'll take that deal <laughs> um, i think a lot of this stuff is all about precedent right and i think as mag says you know canada did it this there's something that happens in the mind with regulators that you know if, if, if it's gone through one place that is it puts it in a whole different category whether when it's being vetted in other other areas um i am curious because a lot of these companies that are having these funds like grayscale are based in the united states uh jp morgan put out that that uh, uh report that it's going to have a temporary crash on the price once an ETF is is released because all the GBTC is going to outflow. But now what we're seeing is at a trillion dollar asset, you can't mess with the price like that like you used to. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see what those funds do. Do they try to roll into an ETF? Because and this is, gets beyond my actual knowledge of why the hell would I keep my money in GBTC if there is an ETF? Was Are there any advantages there? Um. Sorry, I just have to give this shout out to Jason who said ETF escalated toxic femininity. <laughs> but um, <laughs> honestly, like to be honest, you know, I prefer lower fees. Uh, most of them use the same custodian. So in terms of, you know, um, it's not like any of these firms are not reputable or run by criminals. So um, I think like I hope to see a race to the bottom, Trevor, you know, to lower fees, uh, especially if you have, you know, a billion dollars assets under management, like it's one percent or two percent of NAV. That's a lot of money already. It's very different if you're like at a fund of 100 million. Um, I'm already starting to kind of see maybe this race to the bottom between what was in the preliminary perspectives versus the final perspectives. They kind of lowered the fee for um, I think the US ETF that got approved in Canada. Um, and I hope that kind of continues because, you know, what are you competing on, right? Um, but, but again, it is kind of interesting to see, you know, if 
like if it's trading at a discount and like, again, obviously there's like a fear of how low can it go, <laughs> but the, the lower it goes, the more attractive that arbitrage opportunity to become. So I'm really hoping that that gap kind of closes. I think it's, you know, everybody kind of always like uh, when you're an investor, when, when there is a lot of FUD, right? It's the, you know, the anti FOMO is you're like, oh God, oh God, panic. And then they all get onto the train, like the discounts dropping, right? So, well, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see play out. And I hope some of this gets addressed. Nonetheless, it's uh, it's it puts pressure on on uh, the limit already very limited supply of of existing coins and new coins because there's just all these outflows from exchanges. So it's a it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I'm going to say we're close to 170 people live. There's tons of people chatting everybody up. Smash that like button. Give this a share. And we're going to move on to our next reason for being bullish. I'm going to drop down to, to oh yeah. BlackRock launches an ETF like. Mm -hmm. That would be insane. That might be like 10, 11 figures. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, they manage what, like almost eight, between True. eight and nine trillion dollars yeah. of assets, largest asset manager on the planet. And they just the other day said they're starting to dabble in Bitcoin. The guy refused to uh, mention a specific allocation, obviously, because they're probably still trying to like get their position of whatever they're doing but it, you know they're they're doing the same thing as scott menard from uh from um what was it what are they called again uh guggenheim where he was like they projected these massive price levels he's like oh yeah 400k and then it started rising a bunch and he was like oh you know now that's above 35k it's pretty you know you should probably take some money off the table because it's, <laughs> it's it's hit a key technical level fuck you man you said 400k you just want cheaper corn and you, you're not able to buy until february 1st <laughs> and then meanwhile sailor comes in at like 50k yeah i'm buying <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i'll do i'll do some convertible notes at zero percent and just smash another <laughs> Oh man, I love it. Uh, let's jump down to Rohan, dude. What has you feeling bullish this week? Well, I think everything we're talking about is perfect for the R I'm about to drop right now. So I'm gonna read this straight from the news. Coinbase bought the Bitcoin on behalf of Tesla during several days in the first week of February. The transactions went through several over-the-counter trading desks. They said, noting that Coinbase's prime brokerage arm has more than five Fortune 500 clients. This, to me, is one of the most bullish pieces of news I've ever, in the recent history, heard about Bitcoin. Because the more Fortune 500 companies that have Bitcoin on their balance sheet, to me, just eliminates the regulation argument so much more. The idea that the government's gonna ban their highest GMV producing companies is increasingly ludicrous. So the fact that more companies are putting it on their balance sheet a bolster a bolsters the global reserve currency argument and b bolsters the fact that there's it's much less likely the government will heavily regulate it or ban it outright so to me that's huge huge news five we we don't know who they are do we i mean other than no. tesla right Oh, you know, it's just Apple. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. we have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Did you see somebody put together a uh, a meme today and it just said soon and it had it said NGU, but it was the symbols for Netflix, Google and uh, Amazon Prime. But it was the little like arrow oh, in the shape of a U. That was that was key. Like, again, back to Alexander's point of of the memeology of Bitcoin like that was beautiful to see that <laughs> I totally could did not expect it. It's crazy, though, to see Fortune 500 kind of companies. I think it was Pierre Richard. He's like prediction by the end of the year. I think he said like half of half of uh, the S&P or something would have some if, exposure to Bitcoin. If that happens, we're looking at I mean, if that happens, it would be like closer to the market cap of gold at that point. Like that would be a very, very large allocation, not even mentioning the I mean, right now, only 11 percent of Americans own like some percentage of Bitcoin. And if you see Apple tomorrow buying Bitcoin, like you're telling me the the hype is not going to happen. So if that really does come true, I think it's that would be absolute insanity. Like, and and I think crazy. you raise a really good point. So the more U.S. companies get involved, the more people that are deeply respected um, for various reasons, you know, like Elon, Shamas, legendary investors, like 
these guys have clout and they have connections with politicians. They have money for lobbyists. You have Cynthia Loomis, who is a U.S. senator. She's sitting on the banking committee. The more of these kinds of things that we kind of intersect and touch the legacy world, and I know some are kind of against that because it's kind of anti-cyberpunk, but the more of that that exists, it's much harder to just tear it down. Um, and, uh, you know, so so I think it, it's it's fantastic to, to see more and more of that. It's kind of like the Lindy effect, accelerated pace. <laughs> it's it's almost like the, the Trojan horse is already through the gates and just a few of the soldiers are starting to come down and uh, be seen by the normies. Like it's yeah. just, you know, there's it's weird because there's like this this pushback from people that have grown with Bitcoin and been shown as, you know, anti-establishment. But the establishment is starting to recognize the value and be like, oh, shit, our system is kind of fucked. And maybe we should like at least insulate ourselves a little bit from that, you know, in my opinion, eventuality. But for them, it's like, well, there's a slight risk there. So maybe we should just in case move that direction. But I think some people have a hard time not being on the opposite side of that. Some people, you know, and I, you see it with mm -hmm. things like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV, where it's like, they're so deep down that road of we need to be contrarian. We need to always assume that the conspiracy is happening, that it's like, oh, well, because other people are seeing the value, Bitcoin has been co-opted. So you get a lot of those narratives. So it's it's interesting, but I'm curious it's to hear anybody right? else's. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I don't know. Maybe I can get Will or Alexandra. Let's go Will and then Alexandra. Your thoughts? There's the 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 FUD counterpoint to all of this happening in the kind of community is uh, that, OK, you're you have Michael Saylor put on his Bitcoin investment strategy seminar. You saw the SpaceX folks there. You saw, you know, all the Coinbase Krakens. all of them were pitching their services. Clearly, Coinbase picked up five major S&P 500 clients after that. Elon wanted to be the first one out of the gate, make a big splash. Michael Saylor comes back and one ups him again. Um, and we still have, you know, we that report came back saying 5% of all CFOs are planning to allocate to Bitcoin. Um, and we know, looking at the retail play of this, um, if this was a retail group, we know probably 5%, 5 to 10% of those people would lose a lot of their Bitcoin, either getting locked out, phishing scam, uh, a problem holding it. And so the the kind of counterpoint about a potential outcome of this is that you're going to have a um, an irresponsible custodian or an irresponsible corporate treasury who misplaces their keys. Either they're gone phishing attack, an internal rogue employee or something, and you're going to have this uh, major liquidation of their Bitcoin treasuries that's going to cause this renewed effort to regulate and remove the ideas of self-custody per, 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 per chance. And it's all under the guise of we need to keep our corporations and people safe. Is there a risk to that? Is there a risk that we invite this if there's some catastrophic loss or is that an overblown uh, conspiracy uh, from the Bitcoin community? Curious what you guys think. I think you might be right. I, I think it was Lop that I was listening to recently um, or, one of you know people that we respect kind of in the space talking about you know there were um uh like like during like hacker days people like hacked in to uh some of these funds that hold crypto and it was just kind of embarrassing how is that you know bitcoin or other crypto was being um custodied so i think you're right there are a lot of folks that might that probably won't do it the right way you know maybe they won't follow michael sailor's uh, you know, playbook or um, Square, I believe, also open source their playbook on, on how they're treating it. Um, there was an interesting study, I think it was 2018 or 19, that Binance did that showed that um, a lot of these big funds, um, like it was a surprising amount, something like 90% were keeping their their fund on an exchange, like not not talking about, you know, just the amount they're trading. So I think you know, these kind of practices where they're leaving it on an exchanges and we've seen exchange hacks um, there. They're, you're right. I think there is instances of news because not everyone will follow, you know, multi sig and, and cold wallet kind of best practices. Um, so. So, yeah, the, we're in for another roller coaster, I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll disagree a little bit here just to just to um, air out the other thoughts on this. 
I think like there is actually a lot of revenue potential if you think about it for these exchanges to start bolstering security. For example, you know, helping you get set up with your own private wallet. I mean, compared to Mt. Gox to where we are today, two-factor authentication I know is required on Gemini. Coinbase should require it, but you know, that is actually a huge upgrade compared to the previous standards where wallets were and that could prevent a lot of you know though the worries with that but yeah i think my main point is i think coinbase gemini kraken all have a lot to benefit by helping their users you know be more secure for their own sake so they take offload some risk for themselves and for the consumer sake because they can char- upcharge whatever somebody else would charge for those same like features uh for uh security so i think that's like the optimistic side since it's the optimistic bullish thing but yes mount gox is definitely a very a scary thing that i read about yeah well i mean in what's the benefit of of holding on to more people's bitcoin um if they're not actively trading it it is isn't like you assuming you're not running a fractional reserve which mm-hmm. i mean some may uh, but if you're not running a fractional reserve what inherent benefits come with taking the additional risk of custodying other people's money i don't know if anybody has a S- staking a thought to that. in the future maybe i guess yeah. but like even that i just i don't think it's worth the risk right like they're a remote company like it's the bigger this gets the more the pie gets for someone to hack it and i think they're heavily incentivized coming back to satoshi being the goat goat you know they're heavily incentivized to figure out how to get people to have their own wallets and maintain like offload that i think but yeah i think the exchanges that don't custody you know like bull bitcoin and hodl hodl i think uh, you know people should be looking at these more um because yeah bitcoin is all about self-sovereignty and it's not about like you know no one says just trust us in this space you gotta be kidding right so it's important that you you take your security seriously and you know a lot of that onus like goes to the user and people aren't used to that people are used to just like i don't know what to do with my money you just take it because you'll you're the professional you know and how many people have been scammed that way right so uh. yeah yeah I, i totally agree actually to your point like again exchanges like the way that bull bitcoin in canada operates like you you can't even leave it with them if you wanted to so in order to purchase bitcoin you can send dollars to them but once the dollars are in, in your account at the point you decide you'd like to exchange those dollars for bitcoin they require you to provide a bitcoin address otherwise you cannot trade those dollars so um effectively like right away you have to have self custody and i do like that model um i know swan allows for them to custody for you but swan also does really really push that kind of self custody um you know best practice uh, i'd like to see a lot more of that um whether we will or not i i do not know but to your point you know a lot of people are are very very used to that that hand holding and that babysitting and i even had somebody this past week an old friend of mine uh and the the i think the message i got was hey i really i i really am interested in getting bitcoin i don't have any time to research anything i don't want to learn anything i don't want to learn to self custody i don't want to learn to do anything can i just give you money and you buy bitcoin for me and then hold it? i was like i'm not taking the time giving myself the tax implications of having been shown as buying bitcoin on an exchange that i later explain as somebody else's and then holding and securing it for you you're fucking crazy here's a tutorial on how to do it take like half an hour and just like start come on but yeah like nobody wants to do anything for themselves and bitcoin is is the antithesis of that bitcoin is all about personal responsibility mm-hmm. well That's- yeah, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say that's where our government cracked down, like especially after Quadriga, once it, you know, what we learned was that the founder took our money and he traded it away and lost it on other exchanges. He bought, you know, houses, boat, plane, cars, etc. And so when regulators came in, they cracked down on custody and is it immediate delivery, for example, bull Bitcoin. And if it's not, it's a security and there are very strict regulations and guidance now around with you're in exchange and you're custodying on behalf because of like these really bad actors that we've seen in our industry. So custody is such an important piece and so important. And I think too, just for a person to better understand Bitcoin, 
I think you need to hold it yourself and then send it to someone just to see it in action. And it, it's a very different feeling than just, you know, buying uh, an ETF. Yeah. Yeah. And send it to somebody at like three in the morning on a Saturday when banks wouldn't even think of being open, right? In another <laughs> I love country. it. I, <laughs> I I can't wait to see and it's already kind of happening, but I love the idea of of traditional finance like not being open over the weekend and having no way to deal with the fact that like Bitcoin just moons over the course of a weekend and everybody's freaking the fuck out before Monday morning, everything opens up like ETFs and stuff like that. Holy shit. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the kind of implications that we're going to be seeing as like a US ETF drops and you see that kind of a gap over the weekend? It must be very frustrating right now for anyone that wants to buy. And by the way, we have a second US government representative uh, Representative Warren Davison, who now has laser eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what I was going to say is Warren Davidson on this because he's the dude that was used in the word shitcoin in, in the house, which is so hilarious. What a I beast. love it. <laughs> I have a question so for you guys. I'm curious, like, do you see the future with more people owning Bitcoin on an exchange or like with a custodian or do you see it like what do you think is more likely a custodian or them owning their own um, keys and everything like that? I think that's it's not one for for example um some of the more higher net worth individuals that i know mm -hmm. like they're quite vocal in saying i do not custody myself it's with casa or some other company because they're worried they are worried about the you know five dollar wrench attack so it's not so much like it, it's yes there's a self-sovereignty element but there's a real legitimate concern around you know bitcoins forever and if someone comes in and threatens family friends like it, it's so it's yeah it's a lot harder if someone comes to your house right yeah i i kind of get the a... feeling sorry sorry i kind i kind of get the feeling that we'll have i mean institutions are are seemingly getting on the you know you're not your keys not your coins kind of train some of them are starting i think that's some of the outflows from exchanges that we're seeing um but also i mean as more retail comes in inherently they're going to they're not going to take those extra steps initially. So I think we'll see some ebbs and flows um, as there are some high profile losses, uh, which I'm sure are only a matter of time before they happen again, then people will learn their lesson. Also, we had a great example of why, why leaving custody up to somebody else gives you no power over your own money with the whole Robin Hood thing, right? People had money somewhere they expected to be able to do what they want with it. And they found out that's not the case. And some of those people, not all, but some of those people have clued into the fact that if you're outside of that system and you have custody, then nobody can fuck with your money. And so I, I think that was one of the dominoes that will spur that realization. And I, I, look forward to seeing that play out but uh i know will i will and alexander you had something to say so yeah let's ben, let's you, do you well took, and then you, took, you i don't really have anything there. you took my my two things there number one um looking <laughs> at there's been a record outflow of uh bitcoin off exchanges to cold storage incredibly bullish at the same time of this cultural moment of gme uh proving like an a good-hearted um uh, movement, but then realizes that they're just playing on the wrong, they're playing the wrong game that's stacked against them. They cannot, you know, remake the master's house of the tool. So I think that is going to be huge. Now, does that stand or do people forget? People have very short memories. Um, so ultimately, I think it's about up to the builders to make incredible um, tools and uh, services that make it increasingly easy. And I think Unchained, Casa are really in the beginning stages of setting the groundwork for that. And it's only going to get better. You know, it's one of those things. It's like, just wait and see, wait and see. I'm very confident that self-custody is going to be made into something um, that is, you know, not, doesn't, not easy because self-custody should not be easy. The whole point is personal responsibility. Uh, but at least we'll have a really strong framework so that it's not the default is to leave on a custodial exchange. Yeah, hundred percent, Alexandra. You were going to say something, I think, too. Yeah, I think people people aren't used to having power, right? They're they're just not. They're used to either having it completely, you know, eclipsed, or they're just 
they're just not in a position. So it's it's very new to people that you know you own your financial freedom. It's it's not beholden on someone else. So um, that alone is a paradigm shift. And what's really interesting is you see that in the Bitcoin community, you know, you start thinking about money and better money, and then you start making better decisions in your life, just in general. You know, you eat better, you work out more. Uh, you get better sleep, you know, you meditate, like all sorts of other things, right? So it's a, a really interesting um, shift back to kind of giving power back to the people. And I think that's one of the most interesting things that Bitcoin unlocks. I think we'll see this more. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I have the power. That's cool. <laughs> you, you miss. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I, I think, you know, going forward, we're going to see that like in the next probably 10 to 20 years, hopefully we'll see a much more empowered society. Um, you know, it's all about the sovereign individual and reclaiming your sovereignty. And I think that that's really baked into the Bitcoin ethos. So hopefully, um, hopefully that'll continue. Of course, there's going to be companies that are going to they're going to get in and they'll self custody and they'll lose, you know, buckets of money. And that's going to suck. But hopefully they'll learn. And hopefully that, that doesn't happen to the, the average consumer. Um, hopefully people can do the right thing from the start. Um, that would be great. And I think, you know, we do have examples of companies that are doing things right, again, like, well, Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, go to them, custody your own Bitcoin from the very beginning. Uh, don't get involved in the schemes where somebody's just going to hold your bags because, like, they're not going to hold them for you, right? Yeah, so. yeah, I agree. And I, I like your point about um, the second and third order effects of of changing the personal responsibility of money because it does kind of through osmosis leak into the other parts of your life. You, you start considering things for the longer term, your time preference just shrinks and, and you start saying, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm this considerate with like the, some of the basis of every decision that I make in my life, should that not extend to my health, to my family, to every choice that I make? And I definitely experienced that over the past number of years. And sometimes it takes a while to get on that mindset. And, you know, you, you still have high time preference activities that you partake in. I'll have a glass of whiskey here and there and buy some dumb shit that's on uh, bitcoinershit.com. <laughs> but, you know, like God. in general, you make better decisions, I find, over the long term. So, uh, yeah, I do totally agree with that. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to move to our last our last panelist, last reason for being bullish. Before we move on, though, again, we've had well over 200 people in the chat at times here watching live. Smash that like button. Give this a share and keep chatting it up. I'll keep bringing up your chat messages here on screen as we go. Uh, but, Will, it is yours. The stage is yours. And I am curious to hear what has you feeling bullish this week. I, I it, there couldn't be a better or more difficult week to tell you exactly what's making you so bullish because they're just about every damn thing is going the right way. But uh, I would say I'll, I will I'll bring this full circle. So yours was we reached a trillion dollar market cap and uh, maybe 24 hours before we did that, the uh, U.S. government announced that they have a two mil two trillion dollar spending bill. So double the market cap of Bitcoin is coming. And if we look back just in the last year, the money supply was was inflated by 22 percent alone in the last year. And so what this is saying is that we are uh, barely into this you know, halfway through the second month of 2021. And we are clearly on track to not only meet last year's uh, records, but surpass that. And what it shows is at the same time, the kind of. Uh, uh, the, the, but I would think of the kind of Godzilla battle of two monies coming together, the US dollar, which has infinite inflatability, printability that can be used to send airdrop checks to people all around the country, be used for, you know, all uh, many other things, you know, whether you disagree or agree with them doesn't really matter. Then you have Bitcoin that just kind of runs along, processes blocks every 10 minutes. And um, you start to see that this year is being set up for this massive kind of expose of these two money systems that are operating in tandem and that one of them was, you know, once a fringe thing now is quickly uh, going to meet the uh, market cap of gold. And we start to see this battle starting to come together. And you look at the uh, one of my favorite Twitter accounts to follow is the uh, account that follows what you would have what your uh, $1,400 stimulus check would be now if you would have put into Bitcoin which is now $10,000. <laughs> so you start to look at that and you start to math, you know, take these, okay, one money, one monetary supply can print as much as they want and airdrop magic checks to people. It's, it's amazing. 
But at the same time, the more they're printing, that check that they sent you is being further and further inflated away. Where there's other monetary supply that is growing at record parabolic speeds, now turn that 14 into $10,000. And I think we are going to be increasingly facing this fact, the good and bad of both systems, the, the, um, the uh, challenges and opportunities that are both afford. Because number one, Bitcoin has now matured and evolved into something that is can 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 take a one point five billion dollar uh, uh, chunk of a Tesla treasury, and will do that through all the S and P's. And it's both at a point of infrastructure access for retail for corporate um, that really has not been true of it since its founding. And so uh, I am bullish on getting to the final boss level uh, this year and seeing uh, how we. Uh, how we uphold and how these two systems kind of um, have this dance this year. I think it's going to be fun, you know, fascinating to see, but I sure as hell am lucky that I think I'm on the right side of the, the fight. That final boss at the Bank of yeah. International Settlements is a beast. He looks scary. <laughs> Did anybody see boss, him? Will, or is it yeah. someone else now? <laughs> it's Peter well, we, we don't even know. We, we, have to figure, we have to solve this one first, and then the next yeah. one will be revealed. Yeah. Did anybody see the meme of uh, th this is what's holding together the traditional financial system? And it was like the button on his jacket. <laughs> <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> Yo. Oh, That's... man. I love it. I But Will, I, I totally agree. Like it's it's just all all of the things that are lining up right now. You couldn't have asked for a better story for Bitcoin to be in the midst of a bull run. Like if this had, if all of the world events that are happening right now had happened a couple years prior, like in the midst of the bear market, it, you know, there wouldn't have been this kind of like storybook, like rise of, of, you know, a David and Goliath kind of story where David is rising up and Goliath is, is starting to wobble. Um, it's so interesting to see all of the things that Bitcoiners have been talking about and just beating that dead horse for years. And now it's actually in front of us. You're, you're seeing everything that people have been saying, they're going to keep printing money. And then now I have my normie friends being like, can they just print that much money? Like it, it, money doesn't mean anything anymore. I, I've heard normal people say that to me, the same shit that everybody in Bitcoin circles have been saying for years. And it's crazy to see those light bulbs start turning on all of those light bulbs in our own heads that have turned on over the past 12 years, depending on when, when you got in. Uh, we've had those moments and now we get to see friends and family members hopefully have those moments uh before it's too detrimental to them so i don't maybe well I'll, I'll pass it down the line let's let's jump to alexandra um either commenting on anything will said or if you've seen people in your own life that have started to have those light bulb moments because of all of the world events lining up yeah so first i want to shout out to it's uh wtf in 1971 it's one of the best sites to go to to find out what's wrong with the world today and um bitcoin helps fix that so yeah, um, take the time, get, you know, get empowered, get to get to learn what's what's broken and realize that Bitcoin like fixes so many things. And, you know, Bitcoin really does kind of fix everything at its at its core. So now that we have strong money for the first time, probably in history, um, at least, it, you know, in recent history, um, just think of what that unlocks. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mags, do you want to tag anything on to what uh, Will's thoughts were? Yeah, I think. Will raise some really good points and and just kind of along that line. So for, for, a, for a long time now, we've kind of really focused on explaining what is Bitcoin um, because people like we felt like that was the, the key thing, like people just didn't get it. But I'm finding I think now when when someone comes to me, um, you know, asking about Bitcoin, I'm, I'm not thinking what I'm thinking why. For example, that Ross um, and uh, Michael Saylor, uh, Ross Stevens, Michael Saylor interview, I think is just like so eloquent and it jam packed and it really explains why. Um, and, and I think those are the kinds of things that we need to focus on next. Um, and, and it's tricky because there's like we all have dove into this. Um, you know, there's macroeconomic issues at stake. There's the incentives that kind of like 
we we've all spent so many hours of time putting them together and and it seems so much clearer now but i think it's it's and, and memes probably are helping because they're so you know you're packing it in shortly but i think we we need to get a better way to in a in a short um kind of you know short clips or or, or whatever communicate that because there's just so much that goes into that and and it's and and i think why starts to get at that um you know because i am getting a lot of you know people coming in and like oh it's so high why is it so high like this this can't be sustained but if you dive in you know it, you see that you can so i think we we all need to you know um find good resources existing or make shorter ones that help help that yeah and before i get uh rohan's comments i just gotta give a shout out howard floyd dude what the fuck uh, thank you. Yo. He's dropped like three super chats. He, I think he's dropped like 140 bucks on this episode. So, I mean, thank you very much. I will try and pay it forward a little bit and find some plebs that maybe need a, a, a couple tips as well. Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll support some Bitcoin businesses uh, in <laughs> from some of this. But uh, again, thank you. And thank you, everybody that's in the chat right now for chatting up and being here. We're at 210 people uh watching live smash the like button uh give this a share I'll, I'll get rohan's thoughts here on everything we're talking about about the this perfect storm that we are seeing because it's pretty wild uh what do you think man yeah first of all howard you're a fucking beast that was awesome <laughs> it's cool to see um yeah i honestly just think we are ridiculously early in the bitcoin like universe or just like where bitcoin is is meant to be or where it's going to end up and I think that that can continue to be very exciting for more people to learn and figure it out. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, that we were just talking about. A lot of people feel like it's too late. And I think the education on like the people that really care or have a lot of stake in Bitcoin do not think this is too late. Like almost all of the big whales are the institutions are not buying at 30,000 to go up to 50,000, you know. And so I think that's a big piece of education that is an exciting place that we're in describing the perfect storm hey like it feels like we're too late but we're actually just getting started and being able to explain that concisely would you know i think would be really really awesome to continue seeing how the movement develops and yeah like that's why i just think this one trillion thing is just going to be forgotten in, in two months just like 30k was forgotten in like i think like three or four weeks or something like that yeah God, think how boring 30k is right now. Oh God, I'm I swear, so I, I swear, I remember when it was at 30, like when it was hovering there. I just thought, oh, that's the price of Bitcoin. Like, yeah, like 30 something k. I forgot. Oh yeah, like a month ago, I was like, wow, 12k, 17k. That's a lot. And I feel like we're gonna feel the same way about it at 50 right now. Well, not even a year ago, we were at 4k. Like, holy crap! Don't mind me. Don't mind me. It's okay. so we we just did a little look back on our actually Rohan's site uh, actually inspired us to go and do this. So we were looking at a site and we're like, oh my god, look at all this money we could have had it wasted. And they were like, oh, if only the fold card was there back back then. At least you know we'd have gotten some rewards for that. And what would those be? And we looked at our users who were stacking um, in that March area. And anybody who's stacking in that area, now anything they purchased was 50% off. And it's just like, it's it's insane to see the per, how that, it's just when you start to think about this Bitcoin standard and what it does, it is pretty amazing how it can affect all, you know, it's it can affect a corporate treasury in massive ways. You know, Elon made more money on the money he put into Bitcoin than actual car sales. And you look at just everyday consumers just trying to save the money preserve purchasing power who now got all their goods for 50 percent off like that's real help and that's bitcoin delivering it to basically every person in whatever context um that has it so i think it's just a tool that's so powerful and to rowan's point nobody is too late this is the exact time and the least risky time to ever get involved that's yeah. the biggest thing yeah yeah, it's I I, uh, I I you know what guys, I don't know if we could finish it on a better note. So I think that is going to be our closing note. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go down the line one more time. First of all, I want to thank all of you guys uh, for joining me. This always makes my Friday, and this was a killer fucking group. You guys all nailed it. So thank you for being here. Um, we're gonna go down the line one more time. Let people know once again who you are, and more importantly, where to find you. Like if you got a Twitter handle, a website, whatever you want. Uh, let's start with Alexandra. 
Sure. So you can find me at Alexandra933 on Twitter. Um, I have a couple of websites. You can find the podcast at advancedtechmedia.org, and that's advanced without the D on the end because it's all about moving forward. Um, my personal site is advancedtech.io. And um, I want to give a really quick shout out to a Canadian comedian uh, friend of mine who's uh, not able to do live shows because of all the social distancing garbage. Um, so give him a <laughs> give him a follow. You can find him at Unfamous uh, Simon King. He's been doing this for like almost well, more than twenty years. Funny, funny guy. Awesome. We'll do. Check him out, Simon King. Uh, let's go to Megs. Megs, let people know sure. who you are and where to find you. I'm crypto underscore Megs on Twitter. You can DM me. I'm available for consulting. Um, we have a sister channel for education. That's uh, Bitcoin in Spanish. It's been around since 2014. Just education, some very similar to what Ben does. Uh, we're starting to get to do that as well um, in in English. Just just beginning, so please be patient. But um, uh, that's under the MetaMesh channel, and yes, I think those are the main ways. Awesome, awesome. Let's jump to uh, Rohan. Let people know who you are, where to find you. Hey guys, yeah, my name is Rohan Vora. You can find me on Twitter at at Rohan Vora, or if you just search Bitcoin or shit, you'll probably like find me that way if you don't know how to spell my name. And also my roommate, I have to thank him so much. We really worked on this together and you should check him out. His name is at Lo Los Angel Herrera. Um, same thing. If you just look up Bitcoin or shit, you're going to find it. So, you know, thank you guys so much for listening and thank you so much BTC Sessions. This is like truly amazing. Thank you so much for hosting this. This is so fun. It was, it was a blast. I was super glad to have you. And Will, uh, you can round it out here. Let people know who you are, where to find you. Yeah, you can. Uh, I'm again, as I said at the beginning, I'm basically in the business of giving Bitcoin away, everybody. So uh, I'm at foldapp.com. You can find me on Twitter at WLRVS. And um, you can might know us from other projects like Lightning Pizza, uh, playbitopoly.com, uh, and some other fun ones that are coming. So uh, thank you all, Ben. This has been awesome. And uh, we will be in Canada shortly. Oh, don't tease me, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I'm going to fact that you could maybe win a bitcoin like holy i, I get so much fomo and 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 actually i'm almost like i want to mute these guys because i don't want to hear about people winning a whole bitcoin. i know oh god i love it though um guys panel thank you so much everybody in the chat thank you uh i'm gonna i'm gonna drop everybody's uh, audio and video and do my little outro but uh feel free to stick around to say a quick goodbye after we go offline uh so Thank you, guys. Uh, everybody watching, guys, you're awesome. This was crazy. It was such a good turnout today. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for watching and or listening if you're li listening to this audio only on the podcast later. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please do hit like, subscribe, and share. I know I say it a million times, but holy shit, does it ever help? Uh, more people watching, more eyeballs. Uh, it's, it's all gravy if you do that. Of course, if you want to help the show in another way, you can hit up the previously mentioned sponsors down below. That was Leaden. Kobo, BitRefill, and PrivacyPros.io for the Bill Foddle, all linked below. I also have links for all of our panelists. Their Twitter handles are all down there, so you can check them out. And if you really liked what you saw, you can drop me a Bitcoin Lightning Network tip at my tippin.me page. Why was I not sharing my screen there? Anyways, there it is. At my tippin.me page, T-I-P-P-I-N dot me slash at BTC sessions. With that, I am out. Have yourselves a wonderful evening, a wonderful weekend, wherever you may be. And I will see you next time for your daily session. Bitcoin.